So what's a PCBU? Well, as I said before, a PCBU is a, uh, a person controlling a business or an undertaking. But we shouldn't be confused with this reference to the word person because really it's, it's not really a person. It's, it's an employer, it's a contractor, it's a sole trader, it's a partnership. It's really um, the person or, or, or the entity where the primary duty of care rests. And what they've got to do essentially is they've got a PCBU has to ensure as far as is reasonably practicable. So that's this new concept rather than take all practicable steps, which is what, is what it currently is under the Health and Safety and Employment Act. So it's this new duty of care, primary duty of care, as far as is reasonably practicable. They've got to ensure the health and safety of all workers, so not just so I'll explain it shortly in, with some examples, but it's all workers involved in the workplace, anyone else on the workplace, so that could be um, people who are there visiting or you know, coming onto the workplace. They must provide and maintain a safe work environment. They must ensure for the safe use, handling and storage of plant structures and substances, they must provide adequate facilities, they must provide information, training, instruction and supervision for all workers, so that's quite a broader definition, and they must, must monitor the health of all workers and the working conditions of all workers. And as you can see from section 13 of the draft bill, um, a person conducting a business or an undertaking uh, means anyone with it, well, it means whether the person conducts a business undertaking alone or with others, and whether or not the business or undertaking is conducted for profit or gain. Now, people who are excluded are employees of a PCBU. So their duty is as a worker, as I described before. <coughs> So the PCBU is the primary duty holder, the worker is not the PCBU. It's confusing because um, where does a chief executive fit? But the, actually a chief executive is an officer of a company and the chief executive will probably fall into the category of um, the duty of due diligence for directors. But you can hold several hats. But generally, a PCBU is intended to be the person who's in control of the particular workplace. Volu true volunteers aren't included. So um, WorkSafe New Zealand have given an example. If there's a whole bunch of nurses who are in charge, say, of NICU, they've got tiny wee babies that need little hats, and together as a group of nurses, they, they decide to knit hats and then voluntarily give them to the NICU unit for the little babies, they are volunteers. But if they decided that the cost of the wool was too expensive, they, they formed, you know, Knitting Incorporated and employed someone to fundraise the money to buy the wool, then they're a PCBU and they have got the duty to ensure that the worker that they've employed is safe. So be clear about the delineation between um, volunteers. Um, if you are employing someone to look after a, a person in your home, you know, so caregiver, then um, and it's solely for residential work, then you're excluded. And if subsequent to the passage of this legislation, exceptions are passed, then they won't be PCBUs. So to try and explain what we mean there, All of those people can be PCBUs. So the farm owner, so, so I um, am a farm owner and should have, because I'm far better at, uh, well, even though I'm a farmer's daughter, I'm a sheep farmer's daughter, not a dairy farmer's daughter. Uh, and I probably should have employed someone like a farm management company to run our dairy farm. Um, so that would be perhaps your my farm or your farm right. Um, so I have a 50-50 share milker, they are a PCBU, and say our share milker 
through the farm management company if we had one, then engaged someone to build a new cow shed and the cow shed builder engaged an electrician to install a backing gate and the electri <coughs> electrician zapped themselves. <coughs> All of those parties in, in that example are PCBUs and could be held responsible for the injury to the, to the worker. And what that means is that because this concept of PCBU can extend across so many categories, it's critical, and the Act talks about it, or the Bill talks about it, it's critical for all the PCBUs to work, be working together. And what that therefore means is that you really need to understand as a dairy farmer where you sit in the equation and what your responsibilities are. Because first and foremost, you're going to be a PCBU. If you're a farm owner, if you're a share milker, if you're a contract milker, um, you're all, all of those relationships are PCBU relationships under the proposed new bill. To give you um, another example, say for example in uh, a construction setting, there was first of all an engineer who, um, and maybe say an architect, who designed a, a new build. Then the manufacturing com company comes along and pitches to build the new build. They then engage a scaffold hire company and then there's a contractor um, who then uses the scaffolding and then a self-employed electrician is employed by the contractor to come on and uses the scaffolding. If that self-employed electrician then has an, industry, uh, uh, an injury or an accident, again, all of those people are responsible. And what's important to note is because the PCBU applies at every step of the chain, then there are different responsibilities. For example, the engineer designing the building therefore <coughs> needs to, to incorporate in the design specifications um, for example, a synthetic mesh, so that if people fall inside, so scaffoldings, they've got the scaffolding covered falling outside, but if they haven't got synthetic mesh um, for falls inside while the building is being constructed, if they haven't built that into the design specifications, then they haven't met their primary duty as a PCBU under the Health and Safety uh, Reform Bill. So as you can see, you know, every step of the way, there's some quite significant um, ramifications for the industry, the dairy farming industry, depending on where you sit. Um, and it's no good me, um, as a lawyer sitting in my nice warm office, thinking, well, we've got a health and safety plan, we'll be sweet. It's just, it doesn't work. And I need to take a far greater involvement in uh, my farm in terms of ensuring that I have met my primary responsibilities um, as a PCBU because the, the farm owning entity, which is a limited partnership that I'm involved in, is a PCBU. In addition to that, I also have another responsibility because I am a director of that limited partnership. And there is this new positive duty for directors, and this has got a lot of media uh, <coughs> attention, and um, it's this positive duty of due diligence and it relates to officers. So um, if it's a limited partnership, it's a director. If it's a limited liability company, it's a director. But it could extend to partners. It could extend in a partnership. If you're a uh, sole trader and you're, um, you, know, you are your business, it'll extend to you. And um, there was one other entity. I was looking. That's it, chief executive. Thank you. Uh, and it will likely extend to chief executives um, of companies. And directors can now be convicted as a party to an offence. Um, so parties to offence aiding, abetting, inciting, counselling, procuring the commission of an offence. So you've got this positive duty, if you're a director, to act um, diligently. And what that means is that as a director, you must ensure that the PCBU, that is the person who's got primary control of the workplace, is meeting that primary duty of care. And um, I've been directors on boards for a long time now, almost 20 years, and over the years uh, I've sat and chaired audit and risk committees and currently am, for my sins, um, 
on the Audit and Risk Committee of the Dunedin City Council. I don't know if you've got the press up here about the Dunedin City Council. <laughs> anyway, um, <coughs> Audit and Risk Committees traditionally have looked at, for uh, the health and safety has always been on the um, the agenda of risks, you know, for every year, and, and they'll be on the audit plan. Um, but normally, what boards do is they say, right, we've got a health and safety plan, excellent, tick that box. Yes, we have got a system for managing, identifying, and um, minimising, isolating, or eliminating hazards, tick that box. And yes, we've got an emergency investigation procedure, accident and injury investigation procedure, tick. And as far as most boards are concerned, they've met their obligations. That is not good enough under this legislation, legislation if it is passed. And in my view, it will completely blur that line between management and governance, and so it should. Because as a, a, a director exercising your duty of due diligence, you are required to know about health and safety matters. And if you don't, you've got a duty to get up to, to speed and stay up to speed on developments. Secondly, you've got to understand how your operation uh, works, you've got to understand what the risks within your operation are and generally what the risks are associated with within your operation. Thirdly, you've got to ensure that your PCBU has appropriate resources um, to proce and processes to eliminate or minimise risks. And, um, the Royal uh, Commission report made it really clear that employers that put production above safety will become majorly unstuck in terms of this legislation. Um, that certainly is what happened at Pike River, production was put ahead of safety. And I have to confess, as a director, that's a primary uh, matter that you're looking for, is, is my farm production, uh, production where I want it to be. Um, and if you put production on farm ahead of the health and safety of all workers, remember that's everybody coming onto your site, you will be in breach of your obligations in terms of your duty of due diligence under the proposed new legislation. Thirdly, you've got to ensure that the PCBU has appropriate um, <coughs> processes in place to get information to you about incidents, hazards and risks. So you should be getting reports as a director and also a process in place for responding to that information. So it's <coughs> all very real to say, oh yeah, we know that there was, you know, one lost time incident and, and three, um, you know, three um, hazards that were identified. You actually have a positive duty to f make sure that something was done about that in the, in the workplace. Um, you've got to have a process in place for c ensuring that the PCBU is complying with all of their duties and that, that process is implemented. And you've also got to be able to verify that the resources and processes in place are used. So previously, you know, as a director, I would have gone, yes, we've got the processes tick. Now I want to understand and I want to see evidence that people have been trained in and are using all of the health and safety processes that we're implementing in place at the workplace. And really, leadership is a key issue, and you guys might, may not be aware up here in Hamilton, but perhaps those of you who are online from further south, there was a pretty major tragedy uh, down our way back in 2012, and the Easy Rider uh, capsized and sank in Fogo Strait, and eight people died. Gloria uh, Davis, who was the um, widow of the skipper, she was also the sole director of AZ1 Enterprises Limited, which was the... Um, company who owned and operated the Easy Rider, she lost four family members and she was um, she was convicted and fined. Uh, there was three offences. First of all that, or the, sorry, the uh, Gloria was uh, fined $3,000 and given 350 hours community work and the company was fined $204,500 for three offences and they were that she ca caused or permitted the Easy Rider to be operated in a manner causing unnecessary danger or risk to people on board. Secondly, that as a director of AZ1 Enterprises Limited, she acquiesced or participated uh, in the failure of that company to take all practicable steps uh, to ensure that no contractor or subcontractor was harmed while doing work on board the Easy Rider. And thirdly, she operated the Easy Rider knowing that a current maritime document, namely a, master's, a master holding a skipper's certificate, 
it was required and known that it was not held. Um, she was co uh, convicted and discharged of that last offence. So it just goes to show that um, it's all very well um, uh, being a director on uh, companies, but if you don't take an active role in the leadership of, of the health and safety for that business, you're at serious risk of harm. And again, I talked about an amputation that we're dealing with. Um, it was a, a wood splitting business. The husband did everything for the business. The wife had another job. She worked elsewhere, uh, but she did pay the wages and did the GST. She was playing no active part whatsoever in uh, the wood splitting business. The guy stuck his head, hand in a rather large wood splitter to move a bit of wood. The guillotine came down and chopped his arm off. And she was charged with offences under the Health and Safety and Employment Act for failing to take all practical steps because the machine wasn't guarded. Um, we've managed to to um, have that charge removed from her and, and just put to the husband. But the point is, you know, how many um, dairy farmers uh, of large scale um, do you know where the wife perhaps isn't involved to the same extent that perhaps the husband is? And people need to be aware that these risks are very real and if an incident or accident uh, does happen, they'll be held responsible. The penalty regime under the new bill is somewhat akin, in my mind, to driving offences. So in driving offences, you can have careless driving, dangerous driving, or the very bad extreme reckless driving. It's very rare for reckless driving um, to be charged, but very common for careless. And so going the other way around, at the top of the scale, um, Category 1 offences under the proposed Health and Safety Reform Bill is where a duty holder, so remember a PCBU, or a duty holder could also be an officer, um, without reasonable excuse engages in conduct that exposes a person to a, a risk of death or serious injury or illness and is reckless about that risk. So that's right at the high end of the spectrum. Um, so as you can see, um, for a body corporate or a PCBU there can be a maximum fine of $3 million. Uh, an individual or um, a, a director or an officer can go to jail and be fined between three hundred and six hundred thousand dollars and $600,000. Category 2 offences, so this is more in your dangerous um, region, no prison term but uh, a fine of up to a maximum of $1.5 million for a body corporate or PCBU, $150,000 for an individual, $300,000 for an officer, and whoops, and the um, sort of the careless category as I describe it, um, maximum fine of uh, half a million dollars for a PCBU or a body corporate, uh, $50,000 for an individual and $100,000 um, for um, a director. Now, one of the things we always plug is health and uh, safety, uh, sorry, drug and alcohol policies when, when we're talking about health and safety. Because um, there was a decision from several years ago now which involved the Engineers Union in, in New Zealand. And what the employment court made very clear is that if you're going to meet your health and safety obligations under the Health and Safety in Employment Act, then uh, you would take all practicable steps to ensure the safety of your workers whilst at work. And they said that an employer that is taking all practicable steps would have a drug and alcohol policy. And um, you know, it's it still staggers me. Um, we had a case, uh, I can't remember if it was the beginning of this year or late last year, uh, it was ugly on a dairy farm and the allegation was that um, uh, one worker had gone to another uh, farm worker's house on farm and had sexually assaulted the other farm worker's partner whilst he was getting the cows in. Um, in the course of that investigation, it, it turned out that the, the, the pair of them, of both parties, had been out drinking heavily the night before. Um, one of the workers indicated that he'd had about 13 Woodstocks. Uh, he'd got high, you know, those coal, uh, what are they? Coke and bourbon. RTD, yeah. Um, he'd got home uh, from memory about 3 o'clock in the morning and got up about half past 4 to get the cows in. So heavily under the influence of alcohol, using machinery, going into a, um, a, a cow shed with a, a rotating um, rotary platform, <coughs> you know, multiple hazards, and he, you know, clearly heavily under the influence of alcohol and drugs, and the employer didn't have a drug and alcohol policy. I'm just sort of saying, okay, the sexual assault is bad enough, but you know, you've got people coming to work heavily under the influence of alcohol. 
Um, but for a classic example, if you think again of the construction industry, you know, um, and this happens, I see this all the time um, because I'm, I'm practicing across a broad range of industries. You know, often people are out boozing on a Thursday night because it's the night before Friday and there's only one more work, working day. Um, and, you know, if they fall off the roof on, on Friday morning and have a serious harm incident in the alcohol, and the inspector smells alcohol, and you haven't got a, a clear al drug and alcohol policy that says you took all practicable steps, major problem. So one of the things we're heavily pushing in the dairy industry is to make sure that people have drug and alcohol testing. And we strongly advocate the NZDDA, New Zealand Drug Detection Agency, because they have trained, qualified collection agents who have great little vans who can just whip out and do the testing there and then. And it just makes the whole process so much easier, robust. The chain of custody issues are addressed and resolved, and the New Zealand safety standards uh, for testing are also resolved. So, um, in terms of um, WorkSafe New Zealand, um, they have de um, developed a standards and guidance team, and they are releasing regularly um, best practice guidelines, and um, Melissa's going to talk about some of those um, soon, and more are being um, drafted. But, <coughs> excuse me, um, the point is if you don't meet um, guidelines that have been released, then you will be facing this fairly significant uh, fine regime of, in some cases, uh, at the reckless end, up to $3 million. And you can't insure against fines. Um, yes, you can get insurance against your legal costs and any reparation that you might have to pay a victim if there is an, a, a, an injury or death. Um, but even if you're an offshore director, there's no excuses. You still have your duty of due diligence under the new legislation. And um, an, an incident that we're involved with at present, uh, quad bike injury, the insurance covers um, $100,000 but as you, for, for um, reparation. But as you know, or may know, there was recently um, a, a fine given for a quad bike injury for 120. So we're a little bit concerned that our client is uh, underinsured. So again, DRNZ, critical role I think that you should be playing um, is having that conversation out in the field with people to make sure they have got adequate cover, um, the right type of cover and that the cover itself is adequate. Um, and look I've got nothing to do with FMG insurance but in this most recent fatality they have been amazing and uh, in terms of they were the insurer and the support that they have given to our poor client who's um, suffered a fatality has been incredible. So. Look, as I say, I don't have any involvement with FNG, but they are an amazing insurer um, and they are far better than uh, Vero that I've been dealing with in another fatality involving um, a greater. So a little plug for FNG uh, because they seem to, FMG seem to understand farming and, and really seem to understand you know, what is going on on the farm each and every day. Um, if there is an incident on on you know, a, a dairy farm. Inspectors are going to be looking to the level of employee engagement. And, you know, if your health and safety plan is gathering dust, um, or if when they speak to your your, your dairy farmers' uh, employees, they don't know anything about health and safety, and, and, and they disclose that health and safety is not a priority on farm, then all the shiniest policies and procedures um, that you've got in the world won't save you, because it's critical that your clients have got health and safety processes that are regularly monitored, updated, and practically relate to the farm in question. So for example, in the farm that we're talking about with the fertility, um, our lovely client didn't have a written farm um, health and safety policy and procedure manual, but he did buy a special bike with a higher CC rating specifically um, for the purpose of towing a specific trailer. Um, he did undertake regular um, assessments and did undertake an assessment of the driver uh, concern to make sure that he was safe. You know, that's the kinds of things you need to be ensuring that dairy farmers are doing on site. and that. There isn't one size fits all, it just doesn't work. You have to be making sure that the specific policies and processes they've got in place for their property relate to the new, unique features of their property and the unique circumstances of the plant, equipment 
and things that they're using on their specific property. And they will do things like interview your neighbours, they will interview um, <coughs> contractors, and the last thing you want for them to discover is unsafe work practices or unreported um, incidents or accidents. So at the moment we've still got the Health and Safety and Employment Act and it is important because we still have to prevent accidents, we've still got a, a duty, positive duty to provide healthy, healthy and safe work environments and we've still got to meet our obligations under that Act. And um, there is a benefit for um, dairy farmers in doing that because they can reduce their ACC levies by 10% if they've got an adequate and approved health and safety plan that's then approved by ACC. It's critical that um, all dairy farmers have uh, a written policy in place that establish who's got responsibility for what, what your hazard ID and management processes are, how you're going to report incidents and accidents, what your emergency procedures are. And so I think now and going forward it's going to be important that dairy farmers understand what their status is, so currently it's pretty obvious if you're an employer or not, but moving forward, are you a PCBU, uh, are you a worker or are you a, an officer? Um, I think it's going to be critical for everyone at every step of the industry to understand every aspect of their business. So if you're a farm owner, if you're a, um, a share milker, if you're a contract milker, or, or what you are, you need to understand where your responsibilities lie and your responsibility in the business. Check your insurance cover, that's really important. Um, it's important that there is training for everyone associated with the business, that it's regular and that it's ongoing. Um, and that it's regularly monitored and updated, so hazards are regularly identified, monitored, updated, training is provided. And particularly for um, people like farm owners, um, take an interest.